Hey, it's Seth. Thank you for joining me. As you may know, I've written a bunch of books, but this time, this time it's different. I'm here in this short course to talk about a moment in time, an opportunity, the urgent need to think deeply about how we spend our days, about how we are going to engage with our work to build a life that we can be proud of, to do work that matters with people who care. This is a short course about significance, a short course about how we can go ahead and make things better. We begin with the idea that work isn't working anymore. It worked for a really long time. That industrialism, which lasted for more than a hundred years, created the conditions for a lot of people to create a lot of value and wealth. That we built a system all around machines. How can we get machines to be more efficient? How can we use those efficient machines to make more stuff and to create more value? And once we went ahead and got the machines working, then we focused on the people and we invented human resources. And the very name human resources implies that humans are just a machine, a machine to be manipulated and moved forward to create more productivity for the industrialist. But the thing is, work as we know it is broken. It's broken because it is deadening us. It is pushing us away from being alive, from being connected. And yet we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to fix it because he, right here, right now, the situation exists for us to make things better, for us to lean into the opportunity and show up in a different way. I asked 10,000 people in 90 countries to tell me about the best job they ever had. I gave them a whole bunch of choices. And I said to them, of these choices, what made it the best job? Was it that you got paid a lot? Was it that you got to travel? No one told you what to do. And I was surprised to discover that the same four things came up over and over again. They were, I surprised myself with what I could accomplish. I could work independently. The team built something important and people treated me with respect. Accomplishment, independence, teams, and respect. This doesn't really seem that surprising when we think about it. Isn't that what makes us human? Isn't that what can light us up? Isn't that what makes us feel significant? My new book, the Song of Significance is about this idea. The idea that once we've figured out how to get the machines to work, once we've got the factories working the way they work, we have a choice. There's a fork in the road and we need to pick which path we want. When you see a fork, you should take it. On one path is the race to the bottom. How do we get one more little bit of productivity out of everything we do? And the other alternative is to race to the top. When we race to the top, we have a chance to engage in a new bargain, a bargain about how we will create value. This is not about saying to the capitalist, you must make less money and have better snacks. This is not about how can we be industrialists and at the same time, leave a little bit of room for humanity. Instead, what I am proposing is five principles that bring us significant work. The first one is it's our future. The racing to the bottom is enervating and destroying us. The second one is that significant work is a choice, that it's not something that's done to us or for us. Each one of us has to show up and make a new set of commitments to the people that we work with if we care. The third is that we need leaders, not managers. Managers are important, but leadership is in short supply. And we'll come to that in a minute. The fourth one is surprising. We have to seek out and embrace ambiguity, not the cut and dried correct answers of stopwatches and factories, but the ambiguity of we're not sure what happens next. 
And in order to do that, the fifth element of significance is essential skills, real skills, human skills, not the easily measured false proxies of how many words per minute can you type or how many lines of code can you commit, but something deeper and more human than that. Significant work then is our future, but only if we want it to be. Maybe it comes from the top, but it probably comes from each of us. So let me tell you the story of Ray Anderson and Interface Carpet. Interface was started in the 1970s. Building a carpet company from scratch is not easy. Ray had an idea, which was to make commercial carpet in tile form. So if there was a stain or something broke, you could just replace a little piece not an entire floor's worth of carpeting. And the first few years were difficult, but he built a company with his team into one that was small but profitable. And then he read a book by Paul Hawken, and he had a revelation. What he discovered was that Interface, like so many industrial entities, was destroying the planet. But carpets, in particular, are a dirty business, pumping oil out of the ground, turning them into something that is non-biodegradable and creating a lot of waste in the process. And he decided he was going to do something about it. Not he, they, the team. He called together his top people and he said to them, this is what I see and this is what we're going to fix. And then he wrote down on a piece of paper, we will be sustainable. We will be carbon neutral by blank. And he said, I don't know how to do it and I don't know how long it's going to take, but I will support you in the journey to make this change happen. And then he left the room. He said it was their job to figure out how to get there. And it was his job to help them get there. He sought their enrollment and he enabled them to make progress. Ahead of schedule, Interface became the first sustainable carpet company in the world at scale. And now they are even carbon negative. But the point of my story is that if you talk to people who worked at Interface for years, what you will hear is that they had a career, not a job. What you will hear is that that work, that change lit them up. Because what it means to be significant is to make a change happen. Each of us then has the chance to create the conditions for change to happen. Industrialism is about making things more efficient. But this significant work is about making things better, about deciding to commit to one another on this journey toward better. Someone visited the Ford Motor Plant in the 1920s, and in their notes, they talked about what they saw. What they said was that the assembly line was like a marionette pulling strings on people. They wondered how people could get out of bed in the morning, that he didn't understand how it was reasonable to imagine that people would sign up to become jerks, and hence the term that entered our language, being jerked around, the idea that there is a system that will jerk you from this way to that. And industrialism, as I said, works but we can do something better. We can show up, each of us, and create something of significance. It begins by talking about it. It begins by sharing this course. It be begins by understanding it has to come from each of us. The commitment we need to make is a simple question. Let's get real or let's not play. We need to be able to say to the people we work with, I won't waste your time if you don't waste mine. We need to be able to say, these are the commitments we are going to make to each other. 
Significant work is a choice. It is the choice to take responsibility and give away credit, not to seek authority. It is the choice to announce very clearly, we are here to make a change happen. What is that change? That change you specifically seek to make, your organization seeks to make. Can you define who's it for and what's it for? What are we here to do? And it helps to do a simple word shift. The difference between get to and have to. That what we got trained, indoctrinated in from the time we were in first grade is that we have to go to school. We have to take a test. We ask the question, will this be on the test to figure out if we should pay attention? That we do the things we have to so we can feed our family. But significance lies in being able to do work you get to do. We get to have a difficult conversation. We get to invent something new. We get to make a change happen. Intention is at the heart of this, that when people hear about these ideas, they ask, well, how does that fit into the industrial mindset that I have? And the answer is, it doesn't. That what we must do is begin by talking about it. Then we can start taking steps. The first one is that most institutions are eager to let people take responsibility not to give them a blank check and say, do whatever you feel like, make whatever changes you seek, but instead to find people who are raising their hand and say, yes, I can do that. I would like to do that. And it turns out human nature being the way it is, if after you accomplish some change, you give credit to other people, you'll get asked to do it again. Next, we need leaders more than we need managers. Leaders, what is the idea of someone being a leader? A leader is somebody who is doing something voluntarily, something that might not work, creating a future that's different. A manager uses power and authority to get people who are under them to do what they're supposed to do a little faster and a little cheaper. And not all leaders are managers, and not all managers are leaders. And we should be clear about which job you have. This voluntary work of leaning into a change that might not work, done with intention, done voluntarily. If you are following that person because you want to follow them, then leadership is taking place. This is hard to do because we've been indoctrinated for a long time to avoid it. Page 19 thinking is a concept that came from the Carbon Almanac. I spent over a year as a volunteer, seven days a week, working with 300 people in 40 countries, the team is now 1900, to build a 97,000 word almanac on the climate. Every single page is footnoted and illustrated and designed and fact-checked. And we finished this book in five months ahead of schedule with not one significant error. All volunteers, all people who had never built a carbon almanac before. So how did we do it? Well, what we realized at the beginning is that page 19 was going to be in the almanac. So it was page 57 and 68. But page 19 was gonna be in the almanac. And there wasn't one person on our team who by themselves could write, research, design, fact check, lay out and illustrate page 19. And yet, there was going to be a page 19. So we made it clear to the team that what we needed from them was their contribution. Write something, edit something, illustrate something, make it better. Here, I made this. Put it into the world. Take responsibility to the group for what you did, and then let someone else make it better. That once you have permission to bring page 19 thinking to the world, you are on a path to make change happen. So as we said, management isn't always leadership. Your boss has an important job, but they might not be a leader. They might just be the boss. The next thing that goes with that is this concept. 
standards instead of obedience. Obedience baked into education, baked into corporate structures. Obedience says, do it exactly the way I said, that I'm going to measure your responsiveness to my requirements. Standards say, we don't settle for mediocre. We don't settle for not good enough. But we will not tell you precisely what the answer is because we don't know. All we can do is say, this could be better. Let's raise our standards. When we give people the confidence to hear our standards and know that they can exceed them, we are giving them the freedom to bring their insight, their passion, and yes, their humanity to work. A simple example helps bring this home. There is a hospital throughout India called Aravind. The Aravind Eye Hospitals have restored the eyesight of more people than the sum total population of Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York put together. And if you go there for eye surgery, you'll have a choice. You can pay $135 or you can pay zero. It's up to you. The people who work at Aravind adhere to the highest possible standards, that the rate of infection in their surgical unit is less than at a similar hospital in London. The standards are incredibly high, not just for the surgeons, but for everyone who works there. Each person is treated with respect and dignity, regardless of what they paid to be in the hospital. But no one is telling each person exactly what to do. They're using their humanity, their best judgment, to treat people, to heal people, to cure people, because it's that humanity that enables Aravind to thrive. Even though the founder, Dr. V, wanted to create the McDonald's of eye surgery, what he actually did was create the conditions for people to do what they knew they were capable of. Enrollment instead of coercion. Enrollment, not in the sense of public school because you have to go, but enrollment in the sense of, do you want to go? This bus, this bus is going to Tucson. If you want to go to Toledo, please don't get on this bus. We are going to Tucson. Are you enrolled in that journey? Because coercion, coercion is against your will. I'm going to make you do something or I will fire you. I will make you do something or you will get in trouble. That is authority. That is management. But enrollment says this is something we get to do. We are all signed up to have this journey occur. And it doesn't matter what you do for a living. There are people in the funeral parlor business who are enrolled in the journey of giving somebody who is grieving solace. There are people who work in a nursing home who are enrolled in the journey of connecting with a patient who desperately needs human connection. There are people who work at a coffee shop who are enrolled in the change that they can make by smiling at a regular customer at seven in the morning as they are racing for their bus. That this isn't reserved for people who work at fancy high profit companies. This is a choice. Part of what we get to do as people who work in a significant organization is demand and require that mutual respect is expected. That what we ask for is regardless of social standing, regardless of appearance, of caste, of all the elements that industrialism amplified related to social justice. No, mutual respect is expected. Establish the standards, earn enrollment, and then people have the freedom to do the work they are capable of doing while having their humanity preserved and amplified. Criticize the work, not the worker. That when somebody hands you their work, there is plenty of room to talk about the standards, about whether it met the standards, about whether it will create the change we've all agreed we seek to make. But the worker, we don't need to criticize the worker because the worker's job isn't to be obedient. The worker's job is to contribute. 
that what we get is the chance to make a change happen. And ambiguity? Ambiguity is a tricky one because we have been pushed for a really long time to avoid it, and it can be very expensive. Years ago, uh, I founded one of the very first internet companies. My colleagues and I invented email marketing, not spam, but the good kind. And a couple of years into it, Mark Hurst, who worked with me, showed me the World Wide Web. Now, I was in a race, as so many people are in a race to get all their stuff done. And I'm looking at this and I go, I've got one minute to figure out what this World Wide Web thing is so I can get back to work. Because I failed to acknowledge that my work was sitting with the ambiguity of what is this thing? And what we need to do is withhold definition. Just sit with it and wait until we really understand. I looked at the World Wide Web in 1993 or 94 and I said, this is slow and clunky. There is no business model. I'm not going to pay attention to it. Let's go back to working with AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe. And as a result, I cost myself $40 billion maybe because I was in such a hurry to put it into a container. I couldn't take the time to really understand the opportunity that was in front of me. That what we can do is not try to avoid uncertainty, but we can seek it out because that's our job. Our job is to make a change happen. Our job is to live in the liminal space between where we are now and where we will be tomorrow. That industrialists are afraid of this. They will fight it. People will work very hard for certainty. And so the opportunity in a world that is changing faster and faster and faster, where the new normal isn't going to be normal for very long, and tomorrow is definitely going to be weirder than today. In that world, what we have is a chance to sit with the uncertainty and look for opportunities. As we deal with the others, as we deal with the people on our team, as we deal with the things in front of us, what we need to look for is the benefit of the doubt. Why might someone be acting the way they're acting? Why might there be an opportunity here? What does that person know that I don't know yet? One of the challenges we have as we've raced to scale all of the systems in our world is we have been embracing false proxies. False proxies, easy measurements for what might happen that aren't particularly accurate. So Billy Bean, Michael Lewis wrote about him in the great book Moneyball, figured out that for 100 years, baseball scouts in the major leagues had been using the wrong measurements for who was going to be a good baseball player when they were scouting. If that person looked like, quote, an all-American baseball player and had a certain attribute, they wanted to draft and pay that person. And as a result, those kinds of players were really expensive. What Billy Bean figured out is that that was lazy. And in fact, there were a couple statistics that were easily ignored. And it was those players that you could build a team around. Once we figure out that proxies like, did you go to a famous college? What certain things are on your resume? Do you look like me? Do you talk like me? Are you tall? Whatever it is, they're just lazy. And maybe we have a different opportunity. And that opportunity is, instead of looking for what is, quote, classical, what is traditional in the people we hire and work with, we can look for real skills. Real skills are the skills that humans can bring to the table, as opposed to something that we can spec and easily have a computer do instead. Who gets the blue card? About 15 years ago, a friend invited me to speak to a bunch of interns, maybe 15 of them, at a very fancy investment bank in New York City. I showed up not really prepared because I wasn't sure what I was going to encounter. But I walked in and here were all these fancy people in their ties and bow ties and everything else. And they were super privileged. That's what you need to do to get a plum job like that when you're 21 years old as a summer intern. 
and I had grabbed on my way in a stack of blue index cards. And I decided to start with the following exercise. They'd already been working together for weeks. They knew each other. I handed out the blue index cards and I said to them, I'd like you to do something for me. On my way in, I got a call from Bill Gates or maybe it was Warren Buffett, I don't remember. And they've told me that they have a couple million dollars to spend on a research project that's only going to last about a month and they'd like you to run it. And in addition to you running it, they want you to pick three people from this room to be on your team. So you know all 15 or 20 of these people. You got to pick three. There's a big stipend for all of you. And your entire reputation going forward is going to be based on what you came up with. So choose wisely. Write down the names of the three people you'd like to be on your team. Well, there was some social discomfort. I said, don't worry, you won't have to tell me which three names. So people wrote down their three names. I said, now I just want to ask you a few questions. The first one is, how many people here think that the same names came up over and over again? That in this group of 20 people, there were a few that lots of people named and everyone agreed. And I said, second, how many of you think your name came up a whole bunch of times? And there was more discomfort, but a few people said, yeah, probably. And then I said, well, here's the key question. The key question is, if you knew this exercise was going to happen six weeks ago, could you have shown up at work here every day so that you would have been one of those people whose name was written down a lot? Could you have shown up with more generosity and insight? Could you have shown up taking more responsibility and being more helpful? Could you have shown up more as the human you know you are so that you were one of the people that would have been on that list? Because the truth of the matter is, everywhere around you, someone's filling in a blue card. And the truth of the matter is that real skills are a choice. That it doesn't matter whether you went to a fancy college. That instead, what we have is the opportunity to connect with people to do the kind of work we hope to do. That's why hiring shouldn't be considered something like dating. And the goal of all of those interviews is not to find someone you'd like to have lunch with. The goal might be to figure out who is going to bring a diversity of background and insight and opinion and approach to this change we've all agreed we want to have happen. That what we have finally is the chance to build teams, teams of people that are actually teams not just folks who are assigned to be in the same lane by a manager. I want to start wrapping this up with a couple stories. The first one is about the bees. In the Northern Hemisphere, in May, after a long winter, many hives don't make it. But if the hive does survive the winter, its honey supply is depleted. The Council of Maidens, who actually run the hive, will have a meeting and they will survey the state of the hive and they may decide the hive is healthy enough to take a leap. And if it is, they will build a vertical egg chamber and instruct the queen to lay and fertilize a queen egg. There's only one queen per hive. This is an unusual thing to have happen but the queen will comply. And then they will lavish this egg with royal jelly and take care of it as it grows. And then they will say to all the worker bees, also maidens, incorrectly called workers, go collect as much pollen as you possibly can. And there will be a flurry of activity as the bees replenish in just a few weeks the entire supply of honey, filling it back up to the brim. And then based on the weather, within 15 minutes, 10,000 or more bees will leave the hive at the same time. The queen and all the adult bees will simply swarm and leave. Jacqueline Friedman calls this the song of increase. The song of increase once heard can never be forgotten. It is this moment of a leap into the void. These bees are leaving behind all of the honey, the new queen, all the baby bees, they're just leaving. And they will settle in a tree 100 yards away and form a tight ball to stay warm. 
and sing the song of safety, trying to hunker down. They only have three days now to find a new place to live or they will all die. But this moment, this song of increase, this leap into a possible future is thrilling beyond words. But we're not bees, we're humans. And what we seek is the song of significance. The song of significance is that get to feeling, knowing that we matter, knowing that we showed up to make a difference. And sometimes it's hard to do that because the system that got us all here, the system that indoctrinated us, the system that put us through school and enabled us to have the privilege to watch a course like this one, it's all pushing us in a different direction, to play it safe, to do what we're told, to be let off the hook, not to do this human work of being significant. And the last story I wanna share with you happened to me 11 years ago. I got invited to a secret conference in New Mexico, got to bring my family. It was pretty exciting. There were billionaires and authors and playwrights and other folks there. But the reason I went is that I was told that Neil Armstrong was going to be there. Neil Armstrong, as you know, the first person to walk on the moon. And he was going to tell us the story of his journey. It was really cold and they give us blankets and they bring us out onto this mesa. And the stars are all shining, the sky is clear and there's a big campfire in the center of the mesa. We sit down and Neil comes out to tell us his story, his story of his journey. And as he begins to tell the story, the biggest full moon I've ever seen starts to rise over his shoulder. I think there was some advanced planning. And he stops and he turns and he says, I've been there. Here's the thing, folks. There are footprints on the moon. NASA sent three people into space and brought them back safely. When the sum computing power of the entire institution was less than the phone in your pocket. More than 10,000 people working in parallel, together, in teams, over the course of nearly a decade, figured out how to put people on the moon and bring them back safely. So when you're up against it, when it feels like the industrial system won't let us accomplish what we seek, just go outside and look up and realize there are footprints on the moon. If we care enough, we can make something happen. If we care enough, we can sing this song. Thanks for your attention. Go make a ruckus.